I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to present our studies into the genetic causes of complex lymphatic anomalies. I have no conflicts to disclose. Human lymphatic anomalies are a heterogeneous group of congenital lymphatic disorders that usually present before birth or shortly thereafter. They can be isolated um, to a single limb, such as that in primary lymphedema, or a single site, which is most often the cervical facial region for cystic lymphatic malformations. There are also lymphatic anomalies that are diffuse and affect multiple regions of the body, often with trunk involvement. These have more recently been recognized as complex lymphatic anomalies and include central collecting duct lymphatic anomalies, non-immune hydrops fatalis, and generalized lymphatic anomalies. As we as researchers look into this diverse group of lymphatic anomalies, we have asked whether these are diseases are on a spectrum or are they distinct diseases? We hypothesize that by identifying genetic causes underlying CLAs, we could better understand the pathobiology and its treatment. Lymphatic anomalies can present in the fetus with chromosomal loss or gain, such as trisomy 21 and monosomy X. However, more recent studies suggest lymphatic anomalies are due to small nucleotide variants. These disorders have been shown to be caused by either germline or post-zygotic mutations. In germline mutations, the mutation can either be inherited from a parent or occur during meiosis and is carried by all cells in the fetus or the patient. In contrast, somatic mutations occur post-zygotically in a single cell and only the progeny of these cells carry the pathological variant. Genetics of human lymphatic anomalies have shown that they can be due to germline mutations like those in primary lymphedema and hydrops fatalis or post-zygotic mutations in cystic LMs and GLAs. Ultimately, a majority of these mutations lead to hyperactivation of two signaling pathways, the PI3 kinase AKT pathway and the RAS MAP kinase pathway. For studies presented here, we took an approach that would identify both germline and somatic mutations. To do this, lymphatic endothelial cells, or LECs, were isolated from GLA specimens. Once characterized, we subjected them to whole exome sequencing and variant analysis. These studies of LECs from GLA and central collecting duct lymphatic anomalies identified reported and known pathogenic variants and variants of unknown significance. This latter group of variants have been reported in clinical databases as not being benign and carry potential small nucleotide variants predicted to disrupt protein function. These can be broken down into variants predicted to activate the PI3 kinase pathway, those that may hyperactivate the RAS MAP kinase pathway, as well as a group of missense mutations in piezo one which has been associated with non-hydrops mutalis. The question becomes, how do we validate or prioritize variants of unknown significance for further study? First, we analyze tissues and the LECs that carry variants predicted to lead to RAS, MAP kinase, and PI3 kinase AKT pathway hyperactivation. This is important because GLA-10 is heterozygous for a loss of function allele of RASA-1, which is predicted to be recessive while mutations in the PIK3, R3, and TSC2 are outside the coding sequence in regulatory domains. And we compared our results to specimens from a common cystic LM carrying a PIK3CA variant. We found, as predicted, specimens that carried PI3 kinase pathway variants had AKT activation, while GLA-10 with the Rasa mutation had ERK activation. However, the GLA's LACs had activation of other pathways, or basically they had active hyperactivation of both the MAP kinase and, ERK and the PI3 kinase pathway. We next asked if mutations and the status of the PI3 kinase and MAP kinase pathway influences responses of LACs from the GLA's to therapeutics. At clinically relevant doses, serolimus which inhibits mTOR downstream of PI3, PI3 kinase activation significantly inhibited proliferation 50%. However, at lower doses of serolimus, we found that LM 
LUCs carrying only the PIK3CA mutant mutation were more sensitive to seromimus than that of controls, while the GLA LECs with ERK activation were more resistant. We next asked if these cells would be sensitive to ERK inhibition with UO126, and we did, found at doses used in mouse studies that UO126 suppressed proliferation of all of the lymphatic endothelial cells about 50%. More recently, we were enrolled a GLA patient in which we identified a germline mutation in PTPN11. The neonate presented with chylothorax and abdominal ascites, MR lymphangiography, where dye is injected into the inguinal lymph node, shows lymphatic hyperplasia at the periphery, but no functional thoracic duct. And when dye was injected into um, adenomous regions, you could see tortuous large lymphatics in the periphery. The first variant that we identified was an activating mutation that is dominant and has been shown to lead to RAS MAP kinase hyperactivation. It is linked to both Noonan's and Leopard syndrome, which are complex disorders with facial morphology and heart defects that have, can have lymphatic vascular defects. The second variant is less clear. Um, as we are not able to determine if it is on the same allele or different allele in this patient, but it is present in a hot zone where activating mutations have been identified. We looked at the activation of the PI3 kinase and MAP kinase pathway in these cells. At baseline levels, these cells have hyperactivation of both of these pathways, which is similar to what we see in control HDLX stimulated with either VEGFA or VEGFC. We have also begun to characterize the piezo one mutations. Loss of function due to truncation mutations are recessive when presented in homozygosity lead to hydrops fatalis. Missense mutations are thought to lead to dominant negative piezo one protein, and they have been associated with fetal edema. At homozygosity, uh, we thus assessed the GLA cases with the piezo one missense mutation. When we stained for piezo one its expression was present in the neonatal control dermis, but when we looked at the patient's vessels, we saw loss of piezo one suggesting that it's forming an inactive complex and being degraded. And then finally, I'd like to talk about a present case where genetics could be used to properly diagnose a vascular anomalies case. In this case, there was a prenatal diagnosis at 27 weeks with bilateral pleural effusions that progressed throughout pregnancy and later abdominal ascites developed an edema in the scrotus. scrotum. The fetal and parental west was performed and although a pathogenic mutation in GLM glomulin was identified, it was not called clinically as a mother was a carrier and asymptomatic, which can occur in 12% of glomulin cases. As multiple compartments were affected, the case was diagnosed as a GLA. However, at six months of age, a prominent abdominal vein became apparent, which over the next year and a half developed into a venous malformation. Taking this into consideration, the patient was resequenced and the glomulin mutation called, and the case was re-diagnosed as a glomulvenous malformation. So just in summary, activation of both the PI3 kinase and RAS MAP kinase pathways is common in GLA LECs, and which may make them less responsive to serolimus. West can identify putative variants, but secondary analysis are necessary to determine if the variants disrupt protein function. And finally, genetics can be used to properly diagnose complex lymphatic anomalies and to guide treatment. I want to thank those, my present and past members in the lab, as well as my collaborators at Columbia University and those at the University of Chicago and Arkansas and our funding sources. Thank you.